so much, Dr. Asante. Um, and thank you for that great introduction. Um, and thank you to the MKA Institute for making this opportunity possible. Um, Dr. Asante, you forgot to include that you are also one of my great mentors along with Dr. Darrell Taiwo Aris, um, and that you also served on my committee chair. So I could not have achieved many of this without you. So thank you so much. And of course, special thanks to all of you for making time on your Sunday afternoon to attend and support these lectures. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna start by asking just a few probing questions. I'm sure most of you, you know, I've thought of this. I was wondering how many of you wear your hair natural um, or have you encountered any negative feedback or response about your hair from other cultures? And how do you feel about that? Um, can anybody answer any of those questions? If you do, you have to unmute just to answer the question, please. Well, to be honest with you, I've been locking my hair since 95 and I don't care. I mean, if someone doesn't like it, that's their issue. I have to do that which is best for me and I have to be able to look myself in the mirror and love myself. So that's all that's important. Agreed, agreed. Um, any negative feedback from having natural hair from anyone? I've been wearing my hair natural since 1967 and my mother cried. She said, oh, what have you done to your beautiful Shirley <laughs> Temple curls? <laughs> <laughs> which I never had. <laughs> you saw that she saw your hair as beautiful curls and coils that were your crown. It's beautiful that she saw it that way. So that was uplifting and empowering. And because of that, and I'm bringing that up because you see, as you can see, I wear my hair in locks as well. And as you can imagine, I've actually received quite a few, a few stir from other cultures and even black people. I think earlier as people were introducing themselves, somebody said, oh, you know, I received most of the trauma from my own people that look like me, you know? And so even from black people, I have received some negative feedback. So I'm gonna start off by just giving you a little poem called Dreadlocks. So this is a word that bothers me a lot idea of my hair being referred to as dreadlock. So let me drop some knowledge, some poetical scientific facts about some stamps in hair against Delilah's treasury for Christians, right? And El Selassie and Zinga, Queen Makiba for the Black historians. They done their tight coils in long intertwined masks, held tight to their crown or hang loose in redemption strands. My locks are historical and there's nothing dreadful about that. So this is a word that bothers me a lot about my hair being referred to as dreadlocks. And all the YouTube scholars, internet doctors, and travel to the Caribbean philosophers need to understand this fact. Long before long hair was a fashion statement, it was reclaiming power and agency. Taking a stance in 1802, Warriors refused to cut their hair until El Selassie's exile was through. This is what we do. We resist. Locks is a symbol of power and strength, of religion, Rastafarianism, the Black embodiment. Sure, even Bob Marley called his matted tresses dreadlocks. This was already a linguistic, imperialistic cultural attack. But he thought in music to reclaim he pushed back against the systematic constraints, anchored the identity by reminding us, oh, pirate, yes, there rabbi. I. <laughs> I know you all know this song. It's time to stand in line with the counter narrative, understanding that ancestors left footprints, legacy business, like pushing back against the word nigger or boy or spook or Aunt Jemima. We wouldn't walk around today saying the same things as if we don't know better. So put some respect on my name, my hair, my skin color. This is African locks, sister locks, freestyle locks, or even Rasta locks. Enough already with this resistance ideology. My hair holds the key to the theory. 
As a born and raised Jamaican, expect to get the pump or a box if you continue to disrespect and refer to my hair as dreadlocks. <laughs> mm-hmm. So <laughs> I started this off today because this hair is a very, very political thing today. And it is a very big form of linguistic imperialism because it starts by dehumanizing the ideas and cultures and identity and then destroying it economically in black communities. We've heard in the news, black kids being told to cut off their locks in school or banned from sports. And if you wear your hair a certain way, you're not considered for certain jobs or relegated to hidden spaces to be ashamed. You can see this all over the news now, the Washington Post, CNN, all media outlets, they're talking and discussing how hair is now a civil rights issue and talking about racist discrimination. So what exactly is linguistic imperialism? This term is a very, very powerful concept. Nobody ever really thought about it or think about it on a broad globe, you know, broader scale until I think it was right around when Donald Trump was running for president. He would say certain things and people would go, oh my goodness, this is linguistic imperialism because he's using these negative words to talk about people from different cultures and different countries and so on and so forth. But linguistic imperialism has been around for a while. And it originally came about with Robert Philipson, a white man in 1992. And he talked about linguistic imperialism. So linguistic imperialism or language imperialism is defined as the transfer of a dominant language to other people. This language transfer comes about in the, because of imperialism. The transfer is considered to be a part of power and traditionally military power, and also in the modern world, economic power. So originally when linguistic imperialism came about, it was when the imperialistic nations was traveling from one part of the globe to another international relations to go and marginalize and capture and minimize the power of other nations or what they call weaker nations. They went to different countries and they used the English language as a way of you know, talking to other people. And when you use the word in the English language, for instance, it destroy other languages and other cultures and other identities. So legacy is not you know, able to perpetuate. Um, historical legacy in different cultures are not being able to be passed down to other children because their language structure and language, which is the backbone, the very DNA of civilization is destroyed. Then that way the imperialistic nations stay in power. So I'm gonna read something briefly to you because it's better read than you know, I can say it. And I was talk about re- uh, racism. And racism has always been a pandemic in the black community. The infestation transition from colonialism and imperialism to the establishment of black enslavement, evolving into generations of social movements. And we see these every day, you know, from Jim Crow to, you know, the black power movement, to today with Black Lives Matter, we see social movements where Black people are resisting every single day. But linguistic imperialism is a terror attack and it has maximized the impact of Black subordination, ensuring that African-Americans is in a constant fight for self-preservation. Linguistic imperialism is a way for people, for white people, to exclude, to exclude Black people from ever socially achieving equality or creating cultural backlash and rhetorical weapons like dog whistle politics used to demonize diasporic people who must fight back to maintain identity and agency. So what is dog whistle politics? We use dog whistle politics all the time, right? So if you go to the nail store, for instance, and they don't want us to know what we talk about, you know, what they're talking about, they'll revert to their language or whatever dialect they speak. We use it too in the black community, what they call Ebonics, you know, or black talk or code switching, right? It's called dog whistle politics. But when white people use it because black people really don't do not have power. When white people use dog whistle politics, it translate and turn into laws and rules and regulations that continue to perpetuate black domination black and brown people, people of color across the diaspora, the domination of black and brown people. 
So linguistic imperialism plays on group dominance in how words and images are used, symbols to show people of color as cold, brutal, unworthy, untrustworthy, and most importantly, not really human. So when they kill us, shoot us down in the streets, and then you hear our, the previous president say, oh, knock them in their head. Don't worry, I'll pay for, I'll pay for, you know, your, your, uh, your law, you know, to get out of, of jail, your attorney to get out of jail and stuff like that. That's because they do not see Black people as really human. And those of you scholars, you know, you scholars who have, you know, learned and studied and taught this way before, you know, I'm a newbie coming on the scene, and, and trying to learn at your feet. Many of you know that this has happened long, long before any of this, right? I mean, and we, and it, even though slavery is not where our history starts, that's where American people start our history. This is where, you know, Americans and European, the colonial, the big, the big four, you know, um, first world countries, this is where they start our history, right? And when by starting our history as slavery, they show us as weak, brutal, dark, evil, unhuman. We could take anything and they will do anything to us to keep us dehumanized. And throughout history, we have resisted and fought and tried to change and reclaim our agency and our identity. You know, but this is what linguistic imperialism does. They use language like nigger, boy and talk down to us. When you talk about dark whistles of whistle politics, when they talk about black and black crime, you know, they're talking about creating laws and rules and rhetoric that will actually go into, you know, legal findings that they will use in court to keep black people down. And we know that that leads to the school to prison pipeline, right? There's a lot of things that come out of this. So, even more specific, talking about laws and we're talking about linguistic imperialism and the transfer of power, um, it's first introduced by Robert Phillipson, as I said, and it's also seen as, seen as a global phenomenon. So linguistic imperialism at the domestic level creates issues in Black education and affirmative action where Blacks are depicted as less qualified than others through their culture, behavior, language structure, and immigrant status. And one specific example that I'm going to talk about, and I talked about this in my research and my dissertation, um, is the rhetor rhetorical underlining of California's Proposition 209 as advocated by its proponents in the mid-1990s. And the rhetoric of the proposed proposition's main advocate, this study find that their rhetoric and advocacy to appeal affirmative action in California promoted the notion of Black people being less intelligent than other groups. Many of you know Afrocentricity, of course, is used as a counter narrative for this. And we're going to talk more about Proposition 209, you know, and I believe Afrocentricity is a strong and powerful advocate, you know, against some of what's happening. Now, in Proposition 209, that's where affirmative came from, where, and it was a Black man, Ward Connolly, who fought against this. So the language showing Black people, the images, keep that in mind, the images, the symbols, we see it on TV in the news, on the media, we see this everywhere where black people are being put down. And some of our own people who I call black card revoked, I wrote a poem about that, you know, are some of the same one perpetuating this narrative and what kind of is one of them in Proposition 2019. So we have black people constantly trying to fill gaps in governments revealed and the duality of racial politics, you know, fighting against the black struggle. So linguistic imperialism is really a kind of colonial hangover. And the best way to really think about it, it's kind of like the Dorian theory. Most of us have learned and have taught, been taught about the Dorian Dorin theory, right? Natural selection. You know, I don't mean to simplify it, but that's actually a really easy way to think about it. So when you think about English and the dominant culture, going to another country or another group of people and brutalizingly destroying their culture and their identity, stealing their name, stealing their language, it makes them weak and more easily subjugated. So we, you know, so linguistic imperialism in a, as an aspect of domination, we see it create economic inequality 
And it's also implied that if you don't speak English, you're not smart or qualified or attractive. So a good way to explain that is if we hear someone from an African country and they speak and we hear their accents, right? You hear their accent and you thought, oh, what are they saying? I don't understand them. You know, they speak so weird. You know, these are all linguistic imperialism ter terminology to put down, you know, and, and destroy the culture and the ethnic accents of those languages. But when we hear white people from Europe speak and they go like this and they speak up from Britain or Europe, wherever, and everybody swoon and they go, oh, wow, they speak so nice right? Linguistic imperialism, because automatically based on their accents and their sounds and the way they speak, they're elevated. So they're seen as better qualified than Black people. They're seen as more intelligent, more beautiful, more attractive. And there's latent to this, right? Because if you see somebody as more intelligent, more attractive, more beautiful, then what's going to happen? They're going to get better jobs, right? Everybody's going to want to be like them, right? Um, they're going to get the opportunity for advancement, for higher education, for scholarship, for, you know, for anything that will progress and build legacy and institutional wealth. So we have to keep this in mind. Linguistic imperialism is a very, very powerful thing. And if you think about it in the Darwin, Darwin theory of natural selection, you know, then of course, this culture going to other cultures and destroying it is then considered natural selection, right? So then that means they're the best, they're the most powerful, and then it perpetuates that concept. All right. So linguistic the discrimination, linguicism, and languagism is unfair treatment, which is based on the use of language and characteristics of speech, including first language, accent, size of vocabulary whether you use complex words or various words. So linguistic imperialism speak of a power of control, right? And it began with the forcing of marginalized cultures to speak the dominant language. Um, have any of you, and I, 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 you don't have to answer, but I'm sure many of you have heard of this experiment where um, children are given black dolls and white dolls and acts to say which one of these you think is more beautiful? Which one of these you think is more intelligent? Which one of these you think is better? Which one of these you think you would like to be? And every single time, those little black and brown children would pick a white doll, right? I mean, we've all heard of this mm -hmm. exercise that has, that has been done, correct? So in this, in this theory, when they pick this, when their children are picking these dolls, there is a distinct problem with that. Because when they're picking these dolls that look white and saying they're more beautiful, they're more intelligent, they're more, you know, whatever the case is, these children are beginning to internalize self-hate. And they're starting to internalize that they do not like themselves. They do not like the way they look. They do not like the way they sound. They do not like their culture. They do not like their language. And then they strive to be like the dominant race. They strive to be white. So when we see people, and of course, this is not a necessarily a bad thing. This is no disrespect to anybody else who wear their hair in weaves or perms or whatever the case may be. Um, we have to do what we have to do to survive in this type of economic system and in this world. But this is part of where the problem began. When we see all the wave, the straight, silky, I mean, I remember, you know, talking to several undergrads who would starve. They have no money. They have nowhere to stay, but they will save all their pennies, 600 to $1,000 to buy the long, straight, silky or the new wrap that will make them look like they're white. And this is where we have a lot of problems because we have to start the counter narrative of renaming and reclaiming and taking back our identity and our agency, which is what Dr. Sante teaches in Afrocentricity. Taking back what, what our identity is and who we are, because if we do not do this, 
you know, we're going to continue down the path, perpetuating the domination of Black people. So the scope is global and it's not just domestic, right? Like we can see linguistic imperialism is white people telling a negative story of the marginalized people they are dominating, telling negative stories. And we all know how powerful it is to tell a story. And that's what language is. As the backbone of civilization, linguistic imperialism is white people telling negative stories about the people they wish to dominate. Can anybody tell me some of the stories that they have heard in real life application where you could say, you know what, that is possibly linguistic imperialism based on what I've shared with you today of what linguistic imperialism is. Can you name some real life contemporary example today of where you've heard of linguistic imperialism? Okay, uh, if I may say uh, the, uh, to the audience, if you have uh, an indication, please, um, please uh, unmute yourself uh, before you answer the question. No if one? You can, if, you, if you can, I'll tell you what you can do. You can also go to the bottom of your screen and you can hit reaction and you can actually raise your hand. It tells you how to raise your hand. If you raise your Hi. hand. Hi, there's some know. hands raised. Okay, there's some hands raised. All right. Um, Beth, Hello. Bethy. Hi. Yes, Bethy, Dr. Ya Elombe. Dr. Uh, ya Elombe, go right ahead. Yes, how oh, are you? Oh, very beautiful. I love your name. <laughs> yes, uh, I did a DINA in 2016 at the Afrocentric uh, with Dr. Malifi and Mama Azama. That's I got right. the name Ya Elombe. Yes, uh, one of the examples I want to share is I'm from Haiti, and there's a, 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 a we celebrate uh, Independence Day on January 1st, 2018. Uh, every January 1st. And one of the story that seemed to be told, and you could tell me if that's an example, is that it was the, the, uh, the French colonizer who gave us this soup and that uh, after we won our independence, then we, uh, then we started, uh, we were able to drink it and we're gonna, uh, and that's how we uh, uh, celebrate our independence. When in fact, the real story, according to what was researched by uh, Professor Mama Baina Bello, is that it was the first empress, Marie Claire Ewers Felicite, who gave us this recipe throughout the 13 years of the revolution. She uh, would uh, help a wounded soldier and she would look at different plant and provision and use that you know, from the land to uh, sustain it. But this is the story that I believe the French uh, probably gave us. Mm -hmm. And then it's been perpetuated throughout. And it's now that you know we're, we're trying, well, I am interfering with this uh, repeated uh, myth. Mm -hmm. Would that be an example of linguistic Absolutely. imperialism? Absolutely, because it's, it, it's, it's an attempt to take away the true history of your culture, to, to dispel the power of your culture and give you a different narrative and a story, right? And Haiti is a very interesting country within itself because Haiti is one of the first country that resisted, which is why Haiti is instilled in so much perpetual pain, right? And, yes. and, um, and starvation and all of that stuff. Haiti is suffering because the French will not let their grip go because internationally they have partnered with other countries to make sure that Haiti suffer over yes. and over and over again. So reclaiming, interrupting, disrupting, you know, of course, you know, we all here know and love Dr. Asante. I mean, like, I don't think I could even be centered had I not met him. So I am so grateful for him and Afrocentricity. But disrupting the ideology of what these people are telling the stories. I think one of the books that we published, Dr. Asante, is called We Will Tell Our Own Stories, The Lions of Africa Speak. Yes. Right. Yes. Telling our own stories is pivotal to the disruption <laughs> of white imperialistic ideology and linguistic imperialism. So that is an excellent, excellent example. Okay. Well, we now have uh, Kebuma. 
uh, uh, Langmer, who is, uh, of course, himself a great communicator, uh, Dr. <laughs> K. Boomer, and a good brother of mine, uh, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Hi, it's so good to see you. Well, likewise, thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. I just have one example. Of course, I travel to Kampala, Uganda most of the time. <clears throat> they have a lake. That lake was called Lake Nalubali. Okay. But on the map, when the British, of course, uh, came there and colonized Uganda, they call it Lake Victoria. <laughs> So what we authors and writers are doing now, so I resisted to call that Lake Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. And most of us writers, Professor Molefi Asante, we still use that. And I remember Professor Molefi Asante, when you were editing one of my book, he said, Langmia, don't use Sub-Saharan Africa. And I said, why? You said this linguistic imperialism. And I searched and I realized tropical Africa is what I use in my book. Mm -hmm. When they named Cameroon, when the Portuguese came and said Cameroon, because they saw the river and said, these rivers of prawns, and we still use Cameroon till today. Yes. Have we resisted? The same with Nigeria, from the word Niger, Nigeria. So this thing is broader than we think. Even our names. I, yes. I don't have, Absolutely. I don't have an imperial name. My name is Kate Boma Langmia. Kate Boma means when the war is coming, I take it from my left hand. Langmia means I am surrounded. Yes. So we are all victims of this <laughs> linguistic imperialism. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Langmia. And and it's so interesting that you brought that up because when you talk about name, that's one of the first things that Dr. Asante taught me when six years ago he helped me change my name. You know, of course, I was born and raised in Jamaica. I still legally go by my white imperialistic name, but only in official capacities. Nobody knows me as anything but Ayo Sekai. That is my way of resisting agency. So when you talk about naming, whether it's a country, culture, or place, or you as a person, that is a pivotal and important part of resisting. So absolutely. Okay, you know, my so friend, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to keep Mark going. Ridley. Mark, go right ahead, Mark. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and I'm enjoying the lecture. Uh, Dr. Sakai, hi to you, and Dr. Asante, hi to you. Thank again you. As Thank well. you, Mark. This is uh, my story. Would be experiences that I'm sure all of us have had in terms of the expectation of African Americans or Africans not being able to excel, and when we do excel, they act as if we're the exception to the rule. And where I'm going with this is in many instances, I was the only black person in the group in corporate America, in school and in other places. And because I was excelled, the compliment was like, oh, you speak so well. Oh, you're not like yeah. them. Oh, you're... we have to be very wary of the compliments that we get because mm -hmm. the compliments in many instances are backhanded compliments. Because mm -hmm. what they're really saying is we didn't expect that. And then they'll turn around and say, you're not like the rest of them. And mm -hmm. in many instances, I would say, oh, yes, I am <laughs> just like the rest of them. Yeah. And if I need to speak Ebonics, or when I get on the block, I can speak that language. And when I get here in corporate America, I can speak this language. But it's almost as if there's not this expectation That's that right. we would do well. And so the compliments that we get is almost, as I said, a backhanded compliment. And then the flip side is whenever you get other Black folks that will tell you, you talk white. Mm -hmm. right? Like, what is that? So what is the expectation there of what you're saying? Are you saying that we as Black people should always be shucking and jiving and doing things tail backwards when you say you talk white? Because my thing is this, doing something in its proper way or correct way cannot be tied to a skin color or a race. Mm -hmm. So if you do something that's proper, you can't ascribe it to it being white, just like if you do something wrong, you can't ascribe it to being black. So yes. it's that experience that I think I've had more than anything else whenever I'm told, oh, you're not like them, or oh, you speak so well, you're so articulate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wait. thank you so much for that, Mark. And you know, the problem is that we kind of go down the rabbit hole with linguistic <laughs> imperialism, right? Because the very notion of speaking English right, is the perpetuation of linguistic imperialism, right? Because English is the language that the white men used to speak to the enslaved Africans. Mm. 
They mm -hmm. wanted to, de to destroy other cultures, other languages, other I sense of identities and names and use this one language as a mean of keeping us in check. So the very notion of us even doing things properly, like how, who defines that? Who determine what is properly? Who determine what, you know, what language is speaking well? Who speaks well? Who speaks properly? Who in language? Who have a better accent? The very notion of that thought in our head is the perpetuation of linguistic imperialism. And the only way to combat that is to do what we are, everyone on this call is doing. We're all doing it step by step, you know, trying to combat, combat this narrative. And that's part of what dog whistle politics is as well. And it goes hand in hand. So when you hear people say, um, you know, okay, the, the white, you know, white, uh, what do you call it? Um, opioid, right? White people are on opioid. Oh my God, right? We have to get them clinics and help and money and support because these are good, good white people that need help, right? And then you hear, you know, um, war on drugs. And these are not just words and rhetoric. These are things that are in legal policy documents that will help the, you know, our local law enforcement keep black people in check. So when they're running out to help white people with opioid, they're telling black people, oh, war on drugs, go kill those people, go lock them up. You know, they're building more prisons now than they are building schools. And Mark, as a principal, you know that, you know, as well, you know, working with young black boys. I mean, that this that's one of the things you're tasked with, with trying to change the narrative at this very, very young age. So negative politics, one of the biggest things that happened recently, and we all know about it, and we're all shocked, right? White people cause an insurrection in the in the capital. Oh my God. All the white people are shocked, and all the black people sitting back going, yeah, okay. You know, this is normal. We expected this because, you know, if it was black people fill in the blanks, if we were marching fill in the blanks, you know, it would be gunshots, jail time. Um, they, they, there would be no hesitation, but because it was white people, nobody did anything. They knew weeks and weeks, months and months, these people systematically coordinated this attack on the on the capital and nobody did anything about it the police was part of it and let me just rewind a little bit the fact that the police was a part of it should be no surprise to anybody right because back in the day when the jim Crow era when the police the 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 militia they called them the militia and they these people were set in force to police black you know black and slave people to make sure that they didn't run away that's how they got their gun laws Right, the militia they then of course went later on to the Revolutionary War, and after they murdered everybody during the during the Blood Wars and everything like that, those are the same people that turned into the police. And then after they turned into the police, you know, actually before that they turned into the the Ku Klux Klan, right? And then they turned into the police. And why are we shocked? Because they're still members of that club. And that's why they could all get away with that. We're as if it was black people or brown people or people of color, those people would have been annihilated. Mm -hmm. And so we need to keep these things in mind. And a fun fact, um, I, I recently researched and was shocked uh, to find out because we talk about the, the white men, the white men all the time, the white men who were going throughout history, you know, um, lynching and killing and murdering black people, creating prisons, you know, all of this stuff. They are presidential candidates and presidents and so on. Okay, we talk about the white men a lot, but we never think of so much about the, the, the woman, the white woman. Where, where are they during the KKK era? What were they doing? Where were, where were they being impactful? You know, we know white women get a thing where get away with things all the time. I think um, my daughter showed me a comedian recently who got a white man who's married to a black woman and he got run through the ringer um, because he went and said that white women, you know, they act like they're so pure and innocent, but they want to go sleep with black men. And then the minute there's something go wrong or they get caught, they say that they were raped or something else and they get mm -hmm. away with it. Today, now we see the Karens and the Kens you know, the barbecue Becky and whatever else we call them, 
you know, asserting their agency because they know they can get away with these things. There was one white woman on the news recently. She was in a hotel and there's a black boy with a phone. She must've lost her phone. And she was demanding that this young kid, probably a 17 year old black boy with his father, empty out his purse, empty out his wallet to prove that he didn't steal it. So black people are constantly proven, you know, guilty until proven innocent. So where was the white people? Let me backtrack on that thought, train of thought. Where were the white women? The white woman, Okay, those women decided when the when their men were starting the KKK, those women then went into the schools. You hear me? Now, this is really, really important. I don't know how many of you know it, but I was certainly shocked when I learned this and I was appalled and suddenly it all just went like it dawned on me. The white woman created school boards. Okay, they created school boards. They went into the schools. And they started determining what the textbooks and the learning books were going to say. And if you do not show the Confederate or white people in a positive light, book publishers and book writers could not get your books in the classroom to teach social studies or anything else. So when we are wondering, wait a minute, what why can't we change the textbooks? Why can't we get better information that is more accurately depicted of American history? This is why. Because white people have made sure that they have capitalized on every opportunity to make sure that we do not know our history. We do not know our name. We do not know our language. We do not know our identity. And therefore, we cannot assert our agency and we cannot stand in an African-centered space to, to defy them or continue to resist. Now, did everybody know about this or am I the only one that is slow and got shocked about this information? No, I think we all, I think, I think we all know, <laughs> we, we're with you. We're all with you. you, you're making a very powerful point. So when we talk about publishing and writing, you know, Dr. Sante, you, you know, you, you've been trying to tell me this for a while when you met me. Publishing on writing, this is why it's so imperative. Like when, when Dr. Santi told you, Dr. Langmia, that you should not use these words, you should say certain things a different way. The start of combating and resisting and disrupting the narrative. This is the start of it. So we see, you know, linguistic imperialism operationalized all the time in our everyday lives. This is powerful. This is, you know, it, it's sinister. And it's got its tentacles deeply ingrained in all of our educational opportunity, in all of our academic opportunity, in all of our work lives. This is just, you know, I mean, it's heartbreaking. This is why this is so important to me because the words is everything. How you say things is everything. You've got to come back and counter, use a counter narrative to take things like dreadlocks. Okay. I mean, there's nothing dreadful about your hair being natural or anything like that. And every time somebody call my hair dreadlocks, I have to stop them and give them some history. Because just because somebody said it at a certain point in time, does not mean we have to keep perpetuating the same thing. Just because I, I was named Denise does not mean I have to claim that all the time. Now I know people are going to resist. I've had people tell me, well, I'm not going to call you Ayo. Right there at Howard University, I've had people, professors tell me that. We're not calling you Ayo. Your name is Denise. Okay? I've had friends and people, no matter how much I tell them how powerful, how important, the significance of this, people are like, we're not calling you Denise. But our own people, our own people will resist the change. So not only are we fighting that uphill battle against other people and their narrative and their culture and their identity stealing and their marginalization and dominance of people of color, we have to fight through, way through the, the mush and the slush and the toxicity of our own people as well. Right. So, okay, you so know, I, yeah, yeah, that, that's powerful. Let, let me just ask, is there another question? We have time for a couple of more questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Farouk. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Zakai. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet, and while in Vietnam, uh, 
there was a slang term for the Vietnamese, and some of you may have heard this term, gook, G-O-O-O-K. And be reminded the brothers that spoke those terms that gook equals spook. So when you come back into the world and you call those Vietnamese gooks, be reminded that people are going to call you spooks, uh, white folks, whoever. And so it, it kind of brings it up to date to what the, the Appy community is experiencing right now with the, uh, with the Asian hate uh, process going on. So you know, there are folks that are, that are calling you know, the Asian folks chink, uh, go back to China, go back to wherever they, they're going from. But it's another form with another culture of uh, linguistic imperialism. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is and that's why this is a global thing, right? Because, you know, it, this goes across the board. It's an international affairs concept. And it and it it needs to be addressed more deeply in the black community, of course, because you know, when you talk about, you know, black and brown people coming from shithole countries and, and then you see people talking about the Latin Americans being, you know, nothing, you know, you're talking about an historical fact where somebody was being called a certain names and what we're dealing with now with Haitian hate, this is not just Haitians that we need to worry about because if you come for one of us, you come for all of us. So all the people of color that usually sit on the, on the sidelines while black people are being attacked, now they're seeing what it's like when it's their turn to be attacked because unfortunately, you know, and my daughter will tell me there are positive and negatives to every stereotype, right? So the, you know, the Asian people are seen as more subdued and, and beautiful and smart, which is why most white people prefer to marry Asian people, you know, whereas black women are at the bottom of the rung. So we all have to stand up against all of the injustices because if we don't, when they come for you, what we really need to stop is white terrorism. What we really need to stop is linguistic imperialism. What we really need to stop is the domination of white people. And the only way we can do that is to start each and every one of us with a counter narrative. And I would argue that of course, you know, Dr. Sante's with Afrocentricity, you know, it's the beginning of decolonizing our educational system. It's the beginning of decolonizing our children's minds. It's the beginning of a counter narrative and asserting our agency unapologetically. And I would really love to hear each of us just kind of shout, tell us one way that you think we can, because I'm taking notes, I'm learning too. I'm a new graduate from Howard University. You know, I'm, I'm newly minted. So I'm, I'm taking notes from you scholars. So if you could all tell us one thing we can do in our everyday life that we can help counteract linguistic imperialism as we know it, knowing now the definition, knowing now that it's the backbone, the backbone of our DNA, of language, of culture, of identity, knowing now the impact on a legislative, legal, politic level, what, what's one thing that you, you can suggest that we can do to interact? And okay, uh, thank department? you very much. I think Coleman, Coleman Holmes, go right ahead, Coleman. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Professor Sante and uh, Professor Ayo. Uh, I think it might be beneficial uh, if we could examine uh, how the Black is Beautiful movement component of the Black Power movement was destroyed. Uh, it might be instructive for us to see, okay, what happened there and what therefore might we do differently to make sure that, that a, a new, uh, deeper rooted Black is beautiful and Black cultural appreciation uh, movement takes root among the masses of our people. All right, thank you for that thank question. Thank you. Okay, that, uh, any other suggestion? I think uh, we have another, we have uh, Calvin. Calvin, go right ahead. Hi. Um, hey. A I O. Hey Denise, how you doing? I know I know her as both names going from many moons ago. Um, one thing I was actually moved to understand that um, when um the Black Panther movie first came out, and um when um Shuri was actually dealing with um the Everett Ross character, she actually and um spoke about it in the movie by calling him colonizer instead of saying hey white man, 
she turned around and said colonizer. So that was a PC way of saying uh, everything that's being spoke, spoken as linguistic imperialism. And it's, it's when, and, uh, when, I, when I actually talked to Io and started to hear her, her, her speech, I'm like, yeah, that did happen. It has been put out there. And if you know how to identify it, and one way to actually start doing these type of things is learning how to identify and understand. If you know how you actually be racially profiled, you know how you actually being um, susceptible to these type of situations, then you know how things start to begin and you could curb it. If you can't curb it, you can stop it or you can just walk away from it. But um, knowledge is always key. And going back to what Mark said, yes, I understand is that if you have a good vocal vocabulary and you actually ex ex say to yourself, exactly how you treat yourself and actually speak correctly. Nice, and you say, oh, you speak the Queen's English. I'm like, yeah, so I was taught. I was taught how to talk. Mm -hmm. I was taught how to have a Caribbean accent. I was taught how you have, have, have an English accent. And even like your own, they will turn around and say, oh, you speak white. I'm like, no, I just know that I talk totally nice and intelligent to actually assert myself. But it's a level of assertion that you have in what arena always shows imperialism, linguistic imperialism because you have to know how to blend in. And that's the first thing, it's always, it's like, it's like a zebra. You, if you like, if you can blend in with the herd, then you know how to run with them. So of course you have to know how to actually see it. Because when I went to what, Philadelphia, and I actually went to go buy some, actually I went to actually a, a liquor store. Then I went to, and I saw the price in the liquor store. I went next door to uh, what you call it, a supermarket, to their liquor section. And after a while seeing a couple of things, I knew that I was being racially profiled. Just for the fact that how they were up on me and dealing with me. But mm -hmm. I accepted and I worked with it just for the fact that, you know, I see you and I'm gonna have you work for me. So mm -hmm. I see how you have to identify things and deal with it if you can. Some people say, I'm not dealing with this, I walk away. Mm -hmm. And some people say, no, that's not right. This is how you correct it. Or you actually just don't deal with it at all. Or just you accept it and you walk away and oh, you perfect your own actions. Okay, can, can can I get can I get Moto in here, and then we, then you can you can respond to both of them, uh, Doctor Sakai. Moto is that is Moto? I thought I saw another hand. Okay, I think uh, Moto. Who's it? Who's this? Is that that's not Calvin? Calvin has just spoken. Okay, respond to Calvin, uh, Doc Doctor Sakai. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Asante. And thank you for that, you know, that suggestions, Calvin. And you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, racial profiling is a very dangerous thing in our society. And it goes back also, you know, to the whole black and black crime, you know, the whole police brutality thing. You know, racial profiling is a part of instigation. It's instigative. Yeah, they want to instigate a problem so that you can act out. So they could point a finger and say, see, see, I told you they were brutal. I told you that they were savage. I told you that they're, you know, they're dangerous. And the minute you react, then all of a sudden you fit a certain stereotype that now they can call the police and have you, uh -huh. you know, now get a record. So we have to very, very be careful. And you're absolutely right about also being able to recognize when you're in a situation that's linguistic imperialistic. If okay. you do not recognize the symptoms, then you cannot heal the illness, right? So a lot of what we've talked about are the symptoms of linguistic imperialism, the talking white, the being put down, the hair, all of these things. They're symptoms of the disease. And recognizing your symptoms, like if you have a cold, you know, like you're going to run to the doctor, you don't know if you have a heart problem, you know, heart problems or, you know, something else is going on. You recognize the symptoms and you can treat the problem. So absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Okay. So, All right. I think uh, you have uh, done such an incredible job. I think we should all give uh, a real big applause to uh, well, Dr. Sante. I, oh, <laughs> um, is my time up? <laughs> you, you, well, you, you, you spent your hour. You, you, uh, you have something else you want to say? Please hey, add. Dr. Dr. Sante, I wanted to give help. Oh, I, I saw your hand, but I thought you had already <laughs> asked. Go right ahead. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sakai, uh, I don't want to give some suggestion. If you read Ngugi's uh, book, <clears throat> type I have. No, no, not a novel. Something turned something new. Oh, okay. Yeah, you learn about her, uh, his discussion about linguicide, equivalent to the general. Yes, the, 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 yes, the death, language death. Yes, in Africa and lingui farm. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, remember, Sheikh and Kadiop said, no nation can ever develop by Absolutely. using the language of another nation. So where is Africa going to? So how many? This is what we need to recognize. No nation can ever develop by using the language of another nation. Africa yeah. is still using the imperial languages as we speak, as their official languages in the African Union, as we speak. That is another challenge. Another challenge which I want to give for the group, all of us here, we should start Africanizing our names. Let us start by, uh, look at Molefi, Kete Asante, Kebuma Langmia, Ayo Sakai. So if you are still keeping the imperialistic name, it, it means that your baptism is too tight to it and you will not extricate yourself from <laughs> the school. I'm just suggesting. <laughs> thank no, you, thank you. I think it's a great. I think it's a great suggestion. I suggested it 40 years ago. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I have always, I've always believed. You know, that I believe two things. One, uh, and and Dr. Sakai, I'm just taking a little, couple of minutes of your time. I believe that the most radical thing that was done by African people in the 1960s was when black women start wearing their hair natural. And Dr. Joyce King mentioned about she has been wearing her since the 1960s. I thought that was the most radical thing, the most revolutionary thing black women could do to say, this is me, this is my hair. <laughs> and then the second thing was to see uh, African people change their names from European names. And I certainly, I, I, I've had a, I had a big problem uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, my phone, there's a, we're having a storm or something coming to Philadelphia, I'm sorry. Uh, but but uh, to, to change their names, but many people change their names from English names to Muslim names. And I couldn't understand that. And the reason I couldn't understand that is why go from one slave master to another slave master? Why not get a Bamaleki name or Yoruba name you know, a Zulu name, any kind of name, except just to go from from being that to that. No, that's not that is that is not liberation. Yeah. So it's a it's a process, and I think that what Dr. Sakai has shown us is that this whole journey is one that sometimes is slow. Sometimes we speed up, but we can't necessarily expect that everybody to be where we are at this moment. They, they, people have to come to that realization. And then once they come to that realization, uh, they will see it so clearly for themselves, you see. But, yeah. uh, but I am certainly uh, appreciative of everything. Go, you, uh, Mutu, how, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I thought that uh, there was a, a time change uh, because it's like 11 p.m. over here in Paris, France. <laughs> you know what time was it? I'm just uh, well, just, you know, I, I said Mutu is coming in a little late, but but I'm so happy to to see you. And uh, did you hear any of the presentation? No, I didn't hear, but I just want to jump on what the, the brother said about the name. Okay, um, go I'm right from, ahead. And, and I'm from Gabon, and I've been experiencing that, that problem of name change um, from the day because personally, I also changed my name actually from a European name from. An African name from my own uh, language, actually, mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, I've experienced here with uh, Paris, for example, from as a student I have, I'm an English teacher, second language in uh, high school, Paris, France, and uh, a lot of African students they still have his name as uh, Dr. Um, Asante was saying. You have a lot of uh, people who are like afraid of their African names. And they always say that they, uh, the name is complicated. Uh, my daughter has uh, Ipunu uh, from Gabon's name, and the friend of her said that, oh, you had a complicated name. I said, no, you have a great name. I mean, you, you name something that you possess. You cannot name something that is not yours. As long as we have European names or Arab names, by the way, we are still their properties. So um, that's a great thing that Adora said. You can't you. name something that you do not possess. Um, you know, they cannot possess me because they don't have my name. I mean, they cannot know my name. Thank you. I may say, um, <laughs> sometimes they said Mutu, what is Mutu? What is masculine or feminine? 
Now they're lost. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Anyway. Uh, thank you very much, Mutu. Thank you. Thank We're you. very happy to have uh, Mutu. Uh, and Mutu, Mutu and I, we have a long history. And I'm just, I always see him when I'm in Paris. And I'm just, uh, he's, he's been to Washington and the U.S. many times. But he's one of the great, great champions of Africa and African people. And uh, and uh, so we're just really happy to see you. So, is there any other question or comment, Doctor Sakai? You want to close out? Um, yes, absolutely. So, thank you again so much, Doctor Sante. Um, I cannot be more grateful to have had this opportunity. And I just have just you know a short four four liner that I would like to say. And that is that whiteness has been weaponized and throughout history it's been synthesized, raving through mountains, hills, and valleys, destroying cultures, races, and ethnicities. And we just need to understand that linguistic imperialism is about power, like most everything else is. This is about power, the power to take, to claim, to steal, to perpetuate their their legacy and their history. And we need to stand a firm, unapologetically black and reclaim all that is ours. And I think I think I saw um, Dr. Alexander. Yes. Dr. Alexander, yes. I'm mute. I'm mute. You're muted. Elcho, you're muted, just unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah no. Okay, thank you so much. Good, good afternoon, go. Dr. Sante and good Dr. Afternoon. Kai. I really enjoyed the lecture. Um, how can one get in contact with you? And to everyone, I was listening to the news this week and with what happened to the agent, uh, the, the group in, in Florida, uh, and, and everyone is rallying around all of them, which is fine. I, I, I don't want anyone to be murdered. Uh, and what have you, but they were announcing on TV this week, and maybe some of you heard here in Philly, They one of the things they want to come out of all of this, they want their uh, culture to be taught in school. They want the <laughs> Asian culture to be taught in school. And I heard that on the uh, news this week, uh, Channel 6. I listened to a lot of the MSNBC and CNN, but I just heard that. So I, I wanted to know uh, how can one contact you, Dr. Sakai? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, can I, Dr. Sante, can I just drop my information in the. Yeah, in uh, the chat. You want to do it in the chat or there's a, there's yes. a, yeah, there's a chat function and you can drop it in the chat function for, for her. You, you, you see it? Yes, I do. I can drop it in there for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, that comment. And it's so funny. I know it's a little controversial, but I know I'm among friends. But one of the things that made me angry in all of this, you know, this whole Haitian thing was the fact that everyone is forgetting that Black people have been enduring all of this racism all the time, right? I mean, every day. And the first thing everyone always say is, okay, Black people need to go and rally around everybody else. Now, this is not to put down anyone else. This is not to say that these things shouldn't happen, just as you said, um, Ms. Alexander. But this is to say that when are they going to recognize that Black people have been consistently do, dealing with this forever? And the mayor of Georgia, I don't remember, I think she must have been on CNN. She actually made a point to that. She said, yes, they say that they're afraid walking down the street. They say that they're afraid for their lives. But Black people have endured this every day every. in this country. And we have to figure out how to fix the, the entire problem, not just for them. And, the, and they're very smart to ask for their, their history being taught in schools. Because as Dr. Sante has taught with revolutionary pedagogy, Afrocentricity, all of the books and all of you scholars have been doing this, you know, we have been asking for the same thing. Exactly. For Black history to be taught in schools, mm -hmm. for, for Black scholarship to be taught in schools, for the truth to be taught in schools. But like I mentioned earlier, because right. white women have, you know, co-opted the school systems through school boards and textbooks, they have ensured 
that black history would never be told. Now, I am sure just like the LBGT community, Asians will probably have better results than we have had, which means that we cannot wait for anybody else to fix the problems for us. We have to, you know, initialize our own disruptions and we have to make the change. We have to be our own change, as Martin Luther King said. We have to be the change we want to see. Well, well, you have started us in the right direction, uh, Dr. Sakai. And I just want to say that we had 97 people listening from around the world. This was a very, very wonderful thing. I want to introduce you to next to our next lecture, which will be April the 11th. And that speaker will be uh, Dr. Emeka Wadi Ora, Dr. Emeka Wadi Ora, uh, who will talk about how Europe maintains a psychotic Africa. Uh, this brother is from Nigeria, and he he's, he's going to tell us how Europe maintains a psychotic Africa. That's going to be a very interesting lecture. So um, let me give you the um, the Zoom ID, and you can give it to. Uh, other people, and I'll make sure that there's no passcode. Uh, the Zoom ID for April the 11th is 843-9783-0977. Now, let me give it to you again. It is 843-9783. 77 and it is um uh, april the 11th at 4 p.m eastern standard time for those of you in california this is eastern standard time four o'clock uh, and for those of you in paris i think paris now may be closer it's a probably an hour different than it was uh, uh mutu uh, i think it's, it's different so uh, and those of you who are in Johannesburg, it's later for it's it's probably another hour closer, but still, I, I'm sure you you must be around one o'clock. But okay, so any other um, uh, information you have, you can also reach. You can look at the chat and reach uh, Dr. Sakai from the chat. We thank you very much for attending. In fact, somebody is just coming in. I think from. Ethiopia, but they're too late. I'm sorry. This is over. You know, people sleep and they wake up. They wake up and they say, "I'm going to catch this," and they miss it. So next time, uh, we will we will be with you. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you guys. Thank. This is a beautiful audience and a beautiful speech. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.